rest of us, but it could even affect all of us here today. Uh, Romans chapter 11 not only introduces the fact that God has turned from Israel to the Gentiles, but down in verse 24, it also gives a, a, a series of warnings there that show us that this age has a conclusion. And I believe we are fast approaching that time, and we're going to pay real close attention to the warning that it gives. And, uh, and I would say the next generation is going to face even... Uh, um, more severe times or see uh, worse times than we have seen, not just in the world and what it's like to live in society, uh, but a departure from the Lord and from his truth. And if you're not prepared for it, if you're not grounded in the truth, you could be led astray uh, into false doctrine uh, as that is a warning that will take place in the last days. Let me begin by reading in verse 15 where we've been studying. Romans chapter 11, verse 15 says, If the casting away of them, that is the nation of Israel, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? That verse in itself tells you that Israel is cast aside today. God's not dealing with Israel, fulfilling his covenant promises with them. It tells you that God is not pouring out wrath, but instead that when Israel was cast aside, cast away, that uh, God began to reconcile the whole world, that is, make the whole world savable through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God is, is doing a ministry called reconciliation, where everyone in the world, not the nation of Israel only, but everybody in the world, is being invited into the salvation that's through Jesus Christ. That's what God is doing. But the verse also says that what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? What God is doing today is going to end, and God will fulfill his promises to Israel and bring in the last days and what the Bible calls the end of the world. So we know what God is doing today, but also realizing that it's not going to last forever. Verse 16 says, For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, God did not break off the believing remnant of Israel, he broke off the unbelieving part of the nation. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then they were, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, but thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear." Let's stop and pray. Our God and our Father, we pray that the fear that you're requiring of, of us today, that that rightful, reverential respect that you so highly deserve might be found in each one of our hearts and we'll take real close attention to the warning of this passage of Scripture today. And Father, I do pray that the younger people of the church would pay even more attention, if possible, than, than how they normally listen. And Father, that they would take these words very seriously. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The illustration there of the olive tree and the, and the branches, the unbelieving branches being broken off that we might be grafted in, we taught that last week. Uh, we, we said we were going to pick up with this, uh, the warning at the end of verse 21, be not high-minded but fear. And we are going to pick up there today uh, by breaking it out into two messages, what I would, was going to teach uh, is going to be exactly how I plan to teach it. But some things I was applying last week, uh, your other pastor, Dave Kasner, uh, mentioned to me something last week that just, it took some of the things I was saying, but tweaked them until they just fit perfectly. And this passage of Scripture, I, I've talked uh, with many people about this passage and, and uh, trying to iron out all the things, and I've never realized that the problem is in the explanation of the upper things. <laughs> That is, in this illustration of the, of the olive tree and us being grafted in, you need to be real careful, and listen to this, that the us in the passage is not us believers. It's us Gentiles. We're grafted into a place of blessing. And it fits perfectly with verse 15, what we were saying there. If the casting away of Israel be the reconciling of the world, is the whole world saved? No. But the whole world has been made savable by the Lord Jesus Christ. And as it calls it, as we would say it from 2 Corinthians 5, reconcilable 
God was in the world reconciling the world. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians, after he says that, he says, be ye reconciled. So the opportunity is there. All the Gentiles have been grafted into the olive tree. We talked about the olive tree as being uh, God's life. But they're grafted in the olive tree so that they can be recipients of the life of Christ, of the blessings of God. But they're not automatically recipient, just like when you see the nation of Israel there, there were unbelieving part of the nation of Israel used to be in the olive tree, didn't they? So they were the recipients of life. God was offering it to the nation of Israel, but in their unbelief, God cut them off and grafted the Gentiles into a place where salvation can be received. Salvation is being offered to us. And when you believe, then you are saved. But right now, everybody in the world is savable. So you need to think of it that way, and, and, and that's the difference uh, of how I was teaching. I was implying last week that the believers of the Gentiles are grafted in. But all of us are, because what I would have taught properly is where we pick up today, is there's going to be a time when the Gentiles are going to be cut out of the olive tree. And, uh, and just, just so you can follow that, start in verse 21. It says, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert uh, cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and were grafted in contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then as you read on, all Israel shall be saved. God is going to go back to deal with the nation of Israel. The fullness of the Gentiles is, there's coming a time where that's going to come in, and when it comes in, the Gentiles are going to be cut out of that place of blessing, Israel is going to be put back into that place of blessing, and God's going to fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel. So there's the warning that we're going to deal with today is about being cut out of the olive tree. And there's a warning that right now God has placed us into a place where we can be recipients of the life of, of God, the salvation of God, and uh, through Jesus Christ, of course, and, and the blessings of God, that God has blessings that he's going to give us on top of salvation. But there's a warning here that rather than being high-minded about it, we ought to fear. Now, when it says there in verse 20, 21, be not high-minded but fear, See, when the nation of Israel was placed in their place of blessing, God gave them a very similar warning. And if you look at these passages, they relate real closely together. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 9. Israel had a place where they were the people of God. They were the recipients, as we would say, of God's blessings. God was offering it to them. He also warns them that they could be cut off all through these passages. But in Deuteronomy chapter 9, Moses begins to remind the nation of Israel of some things. Let me begin in verse 1. Deuteronomy 9 verse 1 says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go and possess the nations greater and mightier than, thy, than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knewest, of whom thou hast heard, uh, hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? By the way, these are the descendants of Goliath. And, uh, and there's some giants that were in the land of Canaan that Israel's about to go in, and God is going to give them the land of Canaan and drive the enemy out. Among them are going to be nine feet tall people that are in that land. He says in verse 3, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God he is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down to, before thy face, so that the, thou shalt drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said unto thee. When you have victory, remember the Lord brought the victory. 
Speak not in thine heart, after that the Lord hath cast them out from before, thy, uh, before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of those nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness, or for the, for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess the land. But for the wickedness of those nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before, from before thee, that he may perform the word which, he, which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not how that thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until thou came unto the place ye have been a rebellious, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. So Israel could think being in that place of blessing, that they are really something. And the Lord says, no, it's the people that were in the land that were wicked. God is going to destroy them and give them to you, but don't be high-minded about it. Don't think you're something. Remember, you're a stiff-necked people. You're a rebellious people. And he, from this point on, he's going to start going through a list <laughs> and reminding them of how rebellious they were all the way until you come to chapter 10 and verse 16, where he finally says to them, circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. So he reminds them how stubborn they were and then tells them to have a circumcised heart, a clean heart, a right heart before the Lord, and not to think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. Because, you know, when you're put in a place where God is going to receive you or God is dealing with you, you could think you're something. And Israel did. And they're nothing. They were no better than us. That God just judged the Gentiles and was offering to Israel a place of uh, blessing. And, uh, and those who didn't have a right heart, they're not going to receive those blessings. They got cut out. And now us Gentiles are being offered some blessings of God. And we're warned not to be high-minded, but to fear. In fact, Romans chapter 11, if you go back there again, It says in verse 18, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then that the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. See, that's kind of what Israel thought. Ah, God wanted, kicked out those Amal Amaleks, <laughs> Amalekins, Amalekins, uh, so that I could have the land. Well, we could almost say like Paul here, <laughs> uh, where he says, uh, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. It was the wick their wickedness that caused them to fall. But Paul says in verse 20, as he's talking about us Gentiles and Israel being the unbelieving nation broke off because of their, uh, their faithlessness, it says in verse 20, And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. Uh, I'm not sure we had the time to look at the verse last week, but if we did, I just, I'll repeat it again. Look over with me to Acts chapter 28. The book of Acts is a record of the fall of Israel and them casting away, being cast away. Half the book, the first part of the book is about God turning to Israel. The last part of the book is God turning from Israel to us Gentiles. The last statement of the book has to do with Paul's last address to the Jews. And, uh, and when they agreed, verse 25... I think we did read it, but ver chapter 28, verse 25, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul, uh, Paul had spoken one word, and he, he quotes Isaiah that says that the, the nation of Israel, is their heart is calloused from the Lord. And so in verse 28 of Acts 28, it says, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles now, not only is it sent to the Gentiles, God has already turned to the Gentiles, and now Israel's testimony of not wanting salvation has been written down in history. God is already, it's not something he's going to start to do, the salvation of God is already done, sent to the Gentiles, but the last part of that verse is what I want you to remember. And they will hear it. Israel had ears, but they would not hear, would they? But Paul says that when God sent salvation to the Gentiles, they will hear it. And sure enough, you follow the Apostle Paul through the book of Acts as he goes into the Gentile lands. There were Gentiles getting saved everywhere he went. 
they would hear it. Romans chapter 11 says in verse 20, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. And what we're to be fearful about, as we're going to go through this passage now, what we're to be fearful about is a time when the Gentiles will no longer stand by faith. A time when the Gentiles will no longer hear the gospel and be willing to believe it. That God broke off Israel, and because the Gentiles were willing to hear salvation, God reconciled the world through Christ and is offering to everyone salvation. That offer of salvation is not going to last forever. This passage is a warning that not only tells us it's not going to last forever, but it's also a passage that tells us what's going to happen in the latter times, and there's other passages of Scripture that we'll look at that will cast a little bit more light on it. He says in verse 21, For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. I mean, if God didn't spare, not, spare the nation of Israel who were his covenant people for, for 2,000 years, then, then what makes you think that, that God in turning to the Gentiles would always forever extend this grace to us? Well, it's not going to happen forever. It says, uh, verse 22, Behold the goodness and severity of God. Now, you need to behold this as we talk about it. Right there, when Paul wrote these words, everyone could see what he's talking about. Beholding is something you can see. And, and as he wrote, now there's people that don't think that God turned to the Gentiles until after Acts 28. Now, Romans was written in Acts chapter 20. And Paul is telling the people right there that they can already see with their eyes the goodness of God and the severity of God. Well, which is where? Where do you look? On them which fell severity. They can already see the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel. According to the law, when Israel would disobey God, God would judge them and they would be scattered out of their land. And you read the book of Acts, Israel is being scattered. Uh, they're, they're losing hold of their nation. And it's not long after these words that they were totally wiped out as a nation. But the, it was already visible. Let me show you how it's visible without you having turned too far. Come over to Romans chapter 15. And look at verse 25. They could visibly see that God is not dealing with Israel and extending the blessings to them anymore. Paul writes in chapter 15, verse 25, But now I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And it, and it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, that is, these Macedonian believers, these Gentile believers, owe something to the Jews in Jerusalem. And here's why. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, not their physical prosperity and all of that, but we Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things. How about eternal life? Is that a spiritual thing? Yes, we've been grafted into the place where we can be recipients of the salvation of God. If we have been made partakers, if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty, Gentile duty, is also to minister unto them in carnal things. That is, minister unto the poor saints at Jerusalem with carnal things. You know what he's sending there? Money. Those people sold lands and gave up their money waiting for the kingdom to come, and God didn't send the kingdom. Instead, God postponed his dealings with Israel and turned to us Gentiles. And so us Gentiles owed it to help them, those poor saints at Jerusalem. But the reason they're poor is not that they gave up some things, is their land is already being uh, destroyed, as Rome is putting persecution against the Jews, and the believing Jews are fleeing out of Jerusalem. They can't even be there anymore. And, and so there is a judgment that's falling. And so there is a severity of God. You can write down for yourself 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, where Paul describes the, that the, the judgment of God has come upon the Jews to the uttermost. And he, also, and he wrote that very early in the book of Acts. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. So when, in chapter 11, when he says, Behold the goodness and severity of God on them, the Jewish people who used to be his covenant people, they are receiving severity. They're receiving judgment. Things are severe there. But toward the goodness. 
Rather than God judging Gentiles, God has turned to us and there's the goodness. You could see the goodness of God. Well, let me show it to you. Come to Romans chapter 2. It says in verse 3, the self-righteous man who will not receive the grace of God to get his soul cleansed as in our, our skit showed, someone who would turn down the grace of God, Paul is warning that person not to do that. In Romans chapter 2, verse 3, it says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and dost the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? You know what the riches of God's goodness is? The offer of you of salvation from all your sins so that you don't have to be damned. That's what the, that's what the goodness is. God is offering the riches of his goodness. He's offering through his grace. Watch the verses. Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance. Forbear means he's putting up now, bearing with you a little bit longer. He's not damning. He's not sending judgment. He's forbearing. He's putting off that judgment until a future date. In the meantime, you can believe on Jesus Christ and be saved from damnation. But some people are despising that time. That is, they're going through the age of grace and they're saying, I'm not too bad. I'm not worried about hell. I'm not worried about the judgment of God. And they're despising the, the riches of God's goodness and his forbearance and, as the verse goes on to say, his long suffering. They're despising that. And Paul's warning them, look, if you despise God's good, the riches of his goodness, of his forbearance and his long suffering, you're not going to escape the damnation of hell. You will find that God will finally judge. He won't be long-suffering forever. But when Paul says, Behold the goodness of God toward the goodness, God is granting to the Gentile salvation. That's the goodness of God. And so they could behold. Paul's there standing in, in all the different cities offering to them salvation through Jesus Christ. They can see that God is offering salvation. They could see it because Paul is doing signs and wonders and they know that this salvation, this offer that Paul is making is coming from God. They could see the goodness of God toward them and they could see the severity of, toward, of God toward the nation of Israel. So this was an established fact. Go back there now to Romans chapter 11. Paul warns them that at this moment... Verse 22 stands, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward the goodness, and then he goes back to that warning, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And this is where it's real important, that little tweaking of information that we were talking about here, is to realize that the cutting off here, so many people read this and think this is, this is, you're a believer and you've messed up too much and God says, you know, I, I can be gracious, but I can't be that gracious. And so finally you've sinned so much that he cuts you off. No, if you look even in the illustration, it was the unbelieving part of the nation of Israel that got cut off. God didn't even cut off the believing remnant of Israel. They, they still have the life and access to the life that God has promised. What it is, it's God is dealing with Gentiles. And, you know, if you just look through the passage, we're talking about gen Gentiles in general. Look at verse 11. It says, I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. It's not just unto the saved Gentiles or the believing Gentiles. Salvation is being offered to all Gentiles. That's why uh, the Gentiles is being used in that full term. Verse 12, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more are their fullness? That is, God's riches of salvation is being offered to all Gentiles. That's why Paul says in verse 13, For I speak unto you Gentiles, all Gentiles. That's why verse 15, it talks about reconciling the world. All the world has been brought into this place that they could be recipients of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. But now Paul warns that you Gentiles, at one time you stood by faith, but I warn you, if you don't continue in God's goodness, you're going to be cut off. That's where we are in verse 22. 
Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And when he does this cutting off, he's not going to cut off the believers. He's going to cut off the unbelievers like he did with Israel. That the unbelieving nations, the unbelieving Gentiles, will no longer be in a place where they'll be recipients of salvation. Uh, it, they'll be in a place of judgment where God is going to judge them. And, and so that's the warning here. He says in verse 23, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, Israel finally realizes and repents and believes that Jesus Christ was their Messiah, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Well, certainly, if he was able to take, as it says in verse 24, for if thou were cut, were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were grafted in contrary, to, uh, contrary into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be, be grafted into their own olive tree? If God's able to take us Gentiles who were unnaturally taken out of a wild olive tree and placed in into the, the recipients of the, good, the, of the fruit of the good olive tree, how much more God will be able to cut us off, take Israel back, put them back in their own place of blessing, and fulfill his promises to them? Certainly God would be able to do that, and the warning of this passage is that that's exactly what's going to happen. Verse 25 says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. That this mystery, that God would turn from Israel and turn to us Gentiles and offer us salvation in this age of grace. That's what we're living in today, the dispensation of God's grace. It was a mystery. It wasn't known before, but it's now known through Paul's preaching. And Paul says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Don't be ignorant of what God is doing, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. Being wise in your own conceit is almost thinking, well, God will never cut us off. God will always keep on doing what he's doing. In fact, Jesus Christ, the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. I hear people saying this all the time, as if Jesus Christ didn't change his dealings with mankind. His character never changes. He's always holy and just and right. He doesn't change. But his dealings with man do change. And what God is doing today isn't going to last forever. And Paul says, don't be wise in your own conceit. Uh, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And there will be a fullness, and then God will go back and deal with the nation of Israel. So there's a warning here. Now in this warning about the Gentiles uh, being cut out of their own olive tree, there is, as I talked to, uh, this passage with several different men, there's, there's, some, there's differences of opinion and, and some, uh, I think, some false information that's being... Uh, um, um, conjectured from the, from the verse. Uh, there's some people that are thinking that, that there's going to come a time when in God's dealings with the Gentiles that there'll be no Gentile who will be willing to hear the gospel. And when they say, say this, they, they're, they're doing two things that you need to know about. Uh, in saying that there's going to come a time where no one, there won't be a one person left on this world that will want to hear the gospel, they relate it back to the days of Noah. Noah preached 120 years, and when it came time to get on the ark, no one got on the ark but Noah and his family. He preached, and no one would hear it, and then God judged the world. And they say that that's how the age of grace is going to end, that when there's no one left that will receive the gospel, then God is going to withdraw grace and bring judgment upon the world. Now, from thinking that that's what the passage is saying, they've also concluded that the rapture cannot be imminent. That is, when God takes us, and it's part of that fullness of the Gentiles, our age ends with God taking us into our place of blessing. Uh, in fact, maybe I should just say that now. In that verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. The fullness doesn't mean the last Gentile believer who fills up the body of Christ. Uh, you probably heard me teach it that way. I've taught it that way. I used to think that's what it meant. I don't think that's what it means anymore. It, it doesn't mean that the, last, that the body of Christ is full. The word fullness means we come to our place of blessing. I, I've learned that from verse 15. 
If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? No, that's not the verse, is it? Oh, verse 12. <laughs> For if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? That's a reference to Israel coming into her fullness of blessings. So there's coming a time there's going to be the fullness of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles are going to come into their fullness of their blessing. The fullness, the last completion of, of what God is going to do for us, we're going to be caught up, we're going to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're going to come into our fullness there. So the fullness of the Gentiles for us is a reference to the rapture, the end of the age of grace. And, uh, and what I was going to say then is those who teach that this warning means that there'll never be a Gentile believer, that the, all the Gentiles, no one else will believe, and when no one else will believe, then God is going to then take us to heaven. If that's the way the passage teaches, then they're saying that the rapture is not imminent. It, 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 it can't take place because they're still Gentiles believing. You can go still go out and tell someone about the gospel, and even though it's not as as readily received as when Paul first went out, there's still people willing to be saved. Uh, we had some people here at the church saved within the last few weeks. So people are still willing to be saved, so they're saying that we know the rapture is not going to happen tomorrow. Well, that, that, the problem is they're understanding the verse wrong. The warning about, uh, about Gentiles being uh, cut out uh, if they don't continue in this goodness of God uh, is not meaning that there won't be one Gentile believer left. And you know how I know that? Uh, several different ways, but first of all, when Israel was cut out because of their unbelief, are we to understand that if God would have continued his program with the Jews, not one other Jewish person would have believed? Well, if you read the record of Acts, there seems to be a growth that's going on in the, in the remnant of believers. They're expanding. They were still willing to believe. Their leaders wouldn't, weren't willing to believe. And there came a time that God, rather than continue to deal with them, cut the unbelievers off. But I don't read that there was ever, no one among the Jews who was willing to believe. I know there was, there's going to be, after the rapture takes place, according to Revelation chapter 7, what, we're on verse 14, multitudes out of every tongue, nation, uh, uh, and language, uh, language, tongue, whatever, <laughs> out of all the nations, there's going to become believers during the tribulation. Well, that means if God would have extended grace, they could have still believed. See, it doesn't mean that there will be no one else willing to believe, because there will be. But it does seem to imply that there comes a time that there is a Gentiles as a whole are not standing by faith, not ready to believe. And as a result, God is going to withdraw his grace. And I want you to see the warnings from other passages of Scripture on this saying, so that you can realize that there is coming this time uh, where this judgment is going to fall. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. That warning of the Apostle Paul not to be, um, be, be not ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that's what's going to happen in the last days with the nation of Is uh, with with the Gentiles, is they're going to become wise in their own conceit, and it's not that there'll be no Gentile willing to believe, is Gentiles are going to get some wrong thoughts about who they are and what God is doing in the world. It's real clear as I look at these passages that what's going to happen in the last days is the Gentiles will fail to be dispensationalists. They'll fail to realize that God has temporarily stopped his dealings with Israel and has turned to us. In their own conceit, they're going to think that God is always going to continue to, do, to deal with us, and after all, we are Israel. And as that becomes more and more predominant, that is going to take people away from the truth and, uh, and, and, and be part of the process of, uh, of the end of the age of grace. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now here's where I... Talk about you younger people listening up. Now listen to these passages. Our day is fast approaching this. In fact, I see it now, and your generation is going to suffer more of the results of it. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and, con uh, com uh, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be received uh, refused if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished, watch this, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. There's a warning of departing from the faith, and you need to spend some time thinking and especially watching for the time in which they're going to teach to, uh, I got to say the word right, um, forbidding to marry and the commanding of abstaining from meat. I know so often we go back into Catholicism and talk about how the priests aren't allowed to be married and how they had these days that Fridays used to be you can't eat meat, now there's other Fridays that they can't eat meat. And we can see it back there and say, ah, look at that, they're, they're wrong doctrinally, that's, a, that's, a, that's seducing spirits, that's doctrines of devils, and it is. But Paul's talking about the latter days, and I'm starting to rather look back and see what's always been taught from the, from the apostate church uh, for centuries, I'm looking at life now and saying, what's going to come into society? What's going to come into, into the Christian faith that's actually going to teach to uh, uh, forbid to marry and the commandment to abstain from meats? Well, I see a growing among Christians, uh, a growing tendency toward vegetarianism. Why that enters into Christianity, I don't know, and I find it dangerous. So I'm watching that. But you know, this forbidding of marriage is a strange thing, you know. We're, we, we went from a time in society where people started living together and now all society shunned that to the point where people living together is totally accepted in society and I would dare say three quarters accepted among Christians. To the point, can we get to the point where we actually, Christians will actually say, we don't need to have a marriage. After all, when you have sex together, you already are married in God's sight. Could a doctrine like that emerge among the saints? And I've heard the saints say it, so I know it can. And especially since we're saying, well, the, you know, maybe it's the state that issues a license and therefore we shouldn't have a license from a state. Well, I don't care about the state part of it. You know what I care about it? The vows and two people standing up and committing themselves for life to be married. I see people, I see it coming a time that divorce is so big that they say don't even vow in the first place, that way you don't have to go through the divorce. And Christians saying, you know, that's not a bad idea. But those verses say that that is coming about, and I see it creeping in, just the fact that among the believers that divorce is rampant tells you that there's something that's approaching a time when they're going to forbid marrying. And, and abstaining of meats. The opposite of that, he tells Timothy, exercise thyself unto godliness. That is, instead of out going and learning all the exercises to tone your body, exercise your soul. Study God's word. In fact, later in that passage, he tells Timothy to, to read and to exhort and to meditate on the scriptures, give himself wholly to these things that he might save himself and them that hear him. Save him from what? The apostasy of these of studying, exercise yourself unto godliness, study God's word, be in sound doctrine, so that you're not led astray when the false teaching comes out there. And so Timothy is to, to give himself wholly to the preaching of God's word, so that not only does he save himself from that apostasy, those people who will hear him. Leon and I are concerned with a whole branch of people that no longer meet together, so that a guy like Timothy can't stand up and preach and warn them. If the saints aren't going to meet together, they're not going to get the warning that the, this passage is talking about that they're going to build them up so they're not led astray. So there's an apostasy coming. The first departure is that some shall depart from the faith. Now that's believers. Believers who are going to depart from the faith. And they're not going to exercise themselves unto godliness. When they don't exercise themselves unto godliness, what exactly are they going to do? Well, look at chapter 6. Chapter 6. 
It says in verse 3, if any man teach the contrary, uh, if any man teach otherwise and, and, and consent not unto wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, so they're not going to exercise themselves with true doctrine. They're going to turn from the faith. It says, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You know where they're going to go? They're going to depart from, they're going to quit exercising themselves unto godliness, and they're going to go listen to preachers who say that gain is godliness. That if you got more money, and you got a new car, and you got a big bank account, then you're godly. God is blessing you. Do you hear that going on today? That, when they don't exercise themselves unto godliness, that's where they're going, and they're there now. That the, the whole Pentecostal and prosperity movement that's going on today, that some people say, look, there's revival in the church. It's not revival. You know what it is? It's apostasy. It's turning from the faith. It's turning from the things that Paul taught us about. Paul warned in Philippians about those who mind earthly things. Our conversation is in heaven. Those people aren't doing that. And everyone's doing it in the name of God. That's why, uh, well, come over to chapter 2 Thessalonians. Well... Oh, boy. Anyhow, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4 warns, don't go there because we've got to go one other place yet. It warns there about the form of godliness. They got the form, but they don't have the, the power. They don't have true godliness. And that's where Paul uh, uh, warns about the last days again. But now come with me to 2 Thessalonians. I've got to get the other side of this out, and I'll just do it in a, a brief couple minutes here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The last days, Gentiles aren't going to stand by faith anymore, are they? The believers are going to depart from the faith. When the believers depart from the faith, that's an apostasy that's going to take place in the last days of the age of grace. Then there's going to be another apostasy that's going to take place. 2 Thessalonians chapter, three, uh, chapter 2 at verse 3 says this. Now you probably want to study this more, but I'll, I'll just say it quickly says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, the day when the saints are going to, uh, we're going to be gathered with the Lord and his judgment is going to start being executed on this earth. That day shall not come except there come a, catch this, a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. That, that the judgment of God is going to take place and we're going to be with the Lord, but there's two things that are going to take place that, that's, going to commence the day of the Lord, and there's going to be a falling away first, and then the man of sin is going to be revealed. Now, that falling away that takes place here, this is not, think of the verses over in, 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 uh, in, in Romans chapter 11, concerning Israel, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, then he warns us Gentiles that we could fall to, doesn't use those terms, but that's what I want you to see in this, there's coming a time when Gentiles, not the believers, but the Gentiles aren't going to stand from faith, they're going to fall. And that, that there's a falling away that takes place here, and when that falling away takes place, the man of sin is revealed. Down in verse 7 it says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Satan is already working, but he's being hindered. That word let means to be hindered. And he's going to hinder until he is taken away, that is, the, whoever's hindering Satan is going to be taken away, and I believe that is the Holy Spirit in us believers today. And we're sealed with that Holy Spirit until the day that we're caught up. But that hindrance is going to be taken away. If God is going to take away the believers out of this earth, who is going to expose the lie of Satan? Nobody. And that's what's going to happen. Down in verse uh, 10 says that this... this Antichrist is going to come with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because, now notice this, they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The Gentiles didn't want salvation anymore, did they? They didn't receive the love of the truth. So it says, verse 11, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned 
who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's coming a time when the Gentiles, there's going to be apostasy of the believer, and then that's the latter time, and then there's going to be this removal of the hindrance that's in this world, and then the people in this world are going to be totally, they're going to fall away, and they're going to come to the Antichrist and believe the Antichrist, and God's going to cause that to happen because they received enough the love of the truth that they might be saved, and God's going to send that delusion so that they'll be able to believe a lie so that they'll be damned. That matches the warning of Romans chapter 11 of what's going to happen in the last days. The saints are going to apostatize, they're going to turn from the faith, and then God is going to withdraw his grace, and the world's going to, the Gentiles are going to be cut off, and the, the world's going to be damned because they didn't receive the salvation that God's offered through Jesus Christ. 